You're listening to the Turn Autism Around podcast, episode number 94. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Barbera, and I have another solo show for you. Today, we are talking about avoiding common mistakes to teach toddlers to talk or to talk more. I think there's a lot of us who are making critical mistakes, and I'm going to go over um, the best ways to go from one to two word utterances and beyond uh, without making these mistakes. So let's get to that. Hi, welcome back to another episode of the Turn Autism Around podcast. Uh, today, I'm doing another solo show where we're going to talk about talking and uh, how to get very young children to talk or to talk more. I think we're making a lot of mistakes and I want to go over those. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this episode is because I attended several lectures through the National Autism Conference at Penn State. Um, last week, I presented on um, the work of Dr. Ami Klin, who I saw present at the National Autism Conference in person at Penn State in 2019. I saw a couple lectures he provided this year, 2020, um, and I wanted to summarize his research because it's so critical for um you all who are listening, parents, professionals, anybody who's listening, especially if you're, if you've been listening for a while, these are, um, really critical pieces of information that I learned some things. So if I learned some things, I want to bring it right to you. So last week, episode number 93, was Dr. the work of Dr. Klin. It wasn't an interview and it was a summary of his work and some of the new things that I've been learning. And today it is uh, based on a lecture I heard, National Autism Conference with Dr. Vincent Carbone in 2020. We're gonna link that in the show notes. So anytime I say episode 93 or episode 94, this is 94. So that is marybarbera.com forward slash 94. We'll get you to the um, show notes, which will be the audio, the video, and all the links we mentioned throughout. So super valuable resource. There's even transcripts that are free of charge. So we put a lot of time and effort into our podcasts and our podcast pages to serve you better. So uh, check out all of those resources. So way back, episode number 26, um, I did a podcast on uh, teaching talking in sentences and seven mistakes I learned um, over the years. So this is going to probably be a little similar, but I'm not going to review those mistakes because they're going to be weaved in here. Um, but I do want to talk about some of the things I learned from this two and a half hour lecture with Dr. Vincent Carbone. Uh, his uh, lecture was called Skinner's Autoclitic, which... Um, I don't, I'm pretty sure I have never done a video blog or mentioned the autoclitic in a podcast. So it is kind of, um, uh, so seeing that title, Skinner's Autoclitic, um, for many of you, especially for the parents, you probably have never even heard that term. For many of the professionals um, out there, you may have heard the term, you may not really understand it. Um, Skinner, B.F. Skinner wrote a book called Verbal Behavior in 1957. And um, the first 11 chapters are all about primary verbal operants, the man, tact, echoic, and interverbal. And that's what I based my whole book on, the verbal behavior approach. It's all the primary autoclitics. It's getting kids to talk first in one word utterances and two word utterances. And um, eventually we'll get to, you know, through, not in my book, but through my intermediate learner course, we get to prepositions and pronouns and, and all kinds of things that do involve some autoclitic um, language. But so basically we need 
we need primary language. We need the primary verbal operants. We need mans and tacks and interverbals and echoics before we can start worrying about uh, autoclitic. Because basically autoclitics are secondary verbal operants. So we need the primary verbal operants going to some degree. And then we add uh, autoclitics to um, change the meaning of things like I wanted something instead of I want. So that's past tense. Um, uh, also, even tone of your voice, like it's going to rain today, uh, basically means like get your umbrella, it's going to rain today. But if I say, is, is it going to rain today or rain today with a question, um, even the intonation of my voice changes the meaning to be like, okay, let me check my weather app, not get an umbrella. So autoclitic is added to primary verbal operants to change the meaning for the listener. So that's why I never really get into it because it is quite technical and it's important for analyzing um, typical language for furthering our, our understanding of kids who are talking in sentences and conversational. But my mission is really to get to kids that are either not talking or minimally talking and not conversational. So I want to, I think there's plenty of room to grow in the, um, with primary verbal operants. So I have never really gotten into autoclitics, but this lecture that Dr. Carbone did, um, basically combined the Skinner's autoclitic and the work of Roger Brown, who I'd never heard of. Um, he wrote a book called a first language and it's 1973 seminal work. Uh, Dr. Brown, uh, per the bio and the back cover is, was a, uh, professor of social psychology at Harvard University and him and his colleagues have spent uh, years, de probably decades, <clears throat> researching how typical uh, language develops in infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. And so after Carbone's lecture, I um, searched for that and got a used copy of it. Uh, it's quite intense and I'm probably not going to read the whole thing ever. Um, and you know, I, I just, uh, was really fascinated by this lecture, which is free of charge. And it's going to be linked in the show notes by Dr. Carbone. But I wanted to, for parents out there and professionals who really don't want to, uh, don't have the time or it's not their focus, their child's not even talking or minimally vocal, you know, diving into Dr. Carbone's lectures, very meaty and very advanced. So I wanted to cover the need to knows some of the things I either learned or it kind of validated, or I got some new numbers, um, that I wanted to share. So, okay. So we, we get the, the Robert, Roger Brown and B. F. Skinner's autoclitic, um, work. That's what Dr. Carbone was trying to tie together to show us how we should be programming for, for young children, uh, with autism, with signs of autism who are not talking as you probably know, I wrote a book called the verbal behavior approach, how to teach children with autism and related disorders. It's in 13 languages. Um, it's still selling better than ever, even though it was published in 2007. Um, as you may or may not know, um, I am publishing a second book through Hay House in the spring. It's going to be called Turn Autism Around, and it's going to be for parents and early intervention professionals who work with kids one to five years of age. So, um, this, this preschool age, it's one to five year old typical language development is, is an area of high, high interest for me. So, uh, that's another reason that I wanted to attend the lecture and I wanted to do this podcast to kind of catch you up. So according to Carbone, Roger Brown has five main stages of language. And in Brown's book, he talks a lot about morphemes, um, which is the smallest unit of language that conveys meaning. 
Again, the autoclitic also changes everything to convey meaning, different meaning. So they are similar. So morphemes are what speech therapists talk about. Um, and so he gives the example, I wanted to eat the cookies. So that's six words and it's eight morphemes because I wanted adds the ed to the end of want and to eat the cookies and that s on the end of cookies is plural and so you get extra credit basically for the two for the ed added to want and the s added to cookies and so even though it's six words it's eight morphemes i talk a lot in my work and in my my new book for sure um, about syllable length and that's through the brilliant work of dr barbara ash who's a slp and a bcbad um, and she um talks a lot about syllable length and how, you know, refrigerator is one word and five syllables. And I want the cookie cookies is five words and five, no, four words and, and, um, five syllables. So, um, morphemes are kind of extra credit. And I talk in my new book about kids that naturally add, start to add plurals and contractions and how as behavior analysts, I've seen a lot of well-meaning professionals and parents who really want to push that language and get children talking in sentences, end up doing a disservice to the child and end up messing up their language even more. So one of the really important things that Carbone said in his lecture was that, um, according to Brown, the first stage of his language only starts with two word utterances. Um, so, um, and we can't get to two words before we get to one word. And I see a lot of people messing up once you get words, expanding that. So, uh, a typical child, according to Brown, needs 300 to 400 two-word utterances before they can expand, before they naturally expand to adding ED, which is past tense, adding ING, adding S's for plurals, adding contractions. I did a podcast interview with Michelle C and that is podcast episode number 78, marybarbera.com forward slash 78. And her daughter, I'm actually um, in the process of writing up her daughter as a case study to be hopefully published in a peer reviewed journal because she joined my course during um, my toddler online course during COVID. And when she joined, we have language samples done and she, her daughter had two, two words, um, in the one hour baseline language sample and only a month, maybe a month and a day or two later, she did another language sample and she had hundreds of words and two word phrases with some contractions and some, um, mommy's car kind of thing. So she naturally added words and her daughter naturally, who was just two years of age, started picking up the, the plurals and the contractions, which is amazing. Um, and I tell my online participants all the time, like the more natural the language comes in, the better the less teaching and pushing we get, we, we do, um, especially in the early years, um, we really have to push the right things. Otherwise we end up making a mess. So, um, what, uh, what I believe we should do, and, and actually this is what Carbone suggests as well, is we need to teach single word mans, which are requests. Uh, we want Ch children to want things. I also, in my early learner programs, I teach combined man's tax and a coex. Everything is under multiple control, um, which is using a shoebox, 
kind of slid in a shoe box. Say shoe, shoe, shoe. As we have a picture of a shoe, putting it, um, saying the word three times, uh, giving it to the child on the third time. We're pairing up. We're using stimulus, stimulus pairing uh, to pair up the, the, the picture and the word for the picture. Um, we want to use reinforcers in the beginning, like mommy, or we could call it ma or mama. Um, shoe, well, shoes aren't really a reinforcer, but to get your shoes on to go outside, it may be a reinforcer. Apple, candy, water, um, anything the child likes. And then some typical things like dog and um, things that the child sees a lot. Um, cup. These are all one words, mostly one and two syllable words is where we want to start. And so we want to combine that. So if a child says, if we're doing the shoebox and we're saying apple, 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 the child says apple or any word approximation, that is because they want to put the card in the shoebox, that cause and effect action, it is part manned. Um, it is part tact because they can see the Apple picture and it's part a coic. And this is why kids like Michelle C's daughter um, make so much progress because uh, we combine all of these and we empower the parents to do these easy uh, lessons. So um, we want to really strengthen the mans and the tax and develop a coic control along the way, if at all possible. So as I'm saying words up to three times, as I'm going up the steps to take a bath, I'm not saying, Johnny, let's go up the steps. I'm saying up, up, up. And once we develop a coic control, then we can start teaching even more words. Um, I did do a podcast on developing a coic control. Uh, so we can link that in the show notes. The next step after the child knows a couple hundred nouns, reinforcers and common things, and mostly one and two syllable words, um, then we're going to want to teach things like adjectives and, ad and verbs, um, actions or verbs, uh, open, come, up, uh, go, uh, kick, throw, um, and the adjectives such as colors, um, big, little, um, but those are complex, um, and you can't just teach them and you can't, when you are teaching kick and throw and open, you need to not teach it in two word phrases because I made this mistake years ago. I said to Lucas, um, you know, I was trying to push the length of utterance before I knew I, I wasn't a behavior analyst back then. I didn't, you know, know how to teach language. And so he really liked the snacks in the cabinet. So I'd say, say open cabinet and he'd say open cabinet. And we practiced that way too much, but we didn't practice open in any other situation. So then when he was having trouble opening a water bottle, for, for like months or years, he'd say open cabinet um, because it was overgeneralized, right? So when we are teaching push or open or whatever, first of all, we need to teach them in isolation and then we need to carefully start teaching them combined. But if you don't have to teach all of this each step of the way, if we, if we teach the basics and have language come in naturally, great. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But we need to be careful. If we are teaching two word phrases, uh, push truck, we have to also push other things. We have to uh, not only teach open door and prompt that, uh, just as many times we need to prompt and transfer closed door. Um, otherwise, we're going to make a mess of things. And then we need to get, you know, hundreds, actually what I said, 300 ish, uh, two word utterances that are sp with spontaneous manding with 
um, tacting hundreds of things, uh, listener responding where you touch banana, that all has to be strong before we worry about increasing any, um, anywhere beyond uh, two word pivotal phrases. Okay, so um, yeah, so Carbone kind of outlined in his lecture, 50 spontaneous mans before we can expand to, to things like, I want the book or can I play outside? Like kids that are saying that can spontaneously request 50 or more items. They can um, label tacked 200 to 300 words. They can uh, touch and listen or discriminate between, you know, hundreds of items. And, um, and that's really been um, my work over the years is getting kids to man, to tack, to answer. Uh, he's also saying they need to answer some what and where questions before we can go to try to prompt or model, can I play outside? Um, or I want versus I see. That is uh, very difficult uh, discrimination that most times gets messed up. So we don't want to do that. Um, we want to um, avoid some of these mistakes like carrier phrases, which I did a video blog on um, a while back. Um, we don't want to prompt, as soon as they have 50 words, prompt, I want a uh, banana. Um, because we, you know, I want banana is five syllables. It's three words. Those carrier phrases, um, it can get very rote and, you know, I want to teach eat banana. I don't want to teach. I want to teach peel banana. I want to teach that a banana is yellow. I don't want to just put a pat carrier phrase in front. Um, that's not going to be helpful in my experience and also in Dr. Carbone's experience and also as it relates to Brown's language development. Uh, we also want to avoid the mistake of just plowing through if articulation is not good. Um, you know, pretzel, if it sounds like pretzel, and then you go adding I want or uh, give me or eat pretzel, then it might sound like I want pretzel or eat pretzel. And then people say, well, you can't understand them, let's put them on a device, which even on a device, if we are trying to shape up huge length of utterances before they get very spontaneous with language, even on a device, is going to be detrimental. Um, so you want to watch for articulation. If, if they have articulation problems, working with a speech and language pathologist, we've done uh, probably five or six interviews with speech pathologists. Many of them are BCBA and SLPs. Um, you can check the show notes for those. Um, but we have to absolutely work with um, speech pathologists and consider articulation and consider um, improving that before we go expanding to other words and adding words. Um, and we, we also, like I said, we want to be super careful about combining those two word utterances. When you teach colors, you don't teach red truck and red balloon. You teach red. You teach it with construction paper. I think I did a video blog on how to teach colors. Um, I see it in my, especially in my intermediate learner course, which is part of my verbal behavior bundle, um, years of mistakes of well-meaning professionals programming for kids want to expand the language, but just make a mess of language. Um, I know I, I made similar mistakes, uh, years ago with my own son and with my clients, but I really do think some of my procedures, like the procedure that I developed to teach colors and interverbal categories and prepositions and pronouns are, um, you know, really work. And if the kids are at the right level, they really work. Um, okay. And then um, Carbone says that Brown suggests that after five or six years of age, that typical language is so complex that trying to figure out mean length of utterances is not very helpful. But until then, from ages one to five, um, we really have to look at 
how typically developing kids are, are, um, are learning to speak. And just bringing it back real quick to, to last week's um, podcast with, uh, with the work of Dr. Klin, Dr. Ami Klin, he suggests that early signs of autism are um, kids getting off track um, with uh, social language, with caretaker child interactions, babbling, imitation, cooing, eye contact, and that um, we need to bring it back even before we talk about language, we need to bring back that social interaction piece that is often missing. So uh, really important uh, in my opinion and based on the work of, of Roger Brown as well as the work of Carbone in this lecture and the work of, of Dr. Sundberg and um, all the all the mentors I've had in the world of verbal behavior, it's super important that we not uh, stress length of utterance, talking in sentences um, before a child is ready for it. Otherwise, we will um, not get the child to their fullest potential language-wise. Um, and that's my goal, to have each child reach their fullest potential and be as safe as independent and as happy as possible. And I want all of you to reach your fullest potential too. Um, so we're all in this together. Hope you enjoyed that short lecture. If you did, um, it wasn't really a lecture or podcast <laughs> solo show, but if you enjoyed the podcast, if you enjoyed other episodes, I would love it if you would subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening. I would love it if you would leave me a five-star rating and review. That certainly does help with trying to spread the word and trying to get some traction with the podcast. We are almost at 300,000 downloads now in a little over a year and a half. And we're, um, we're going to continue because I think the um, parents and professionals and other other interested people who listen are getting something out of it. I get, you know, comments and, and reviews and emails in, and I, uh, I'm not going to stop until we can really help as many people and as many kids and families as possible. So that's my mission. I am super excited about, uh, getting my book in, uh, on time. Actually, it was a couple days early and that new book is going to be called Turn Autism Around. Um, and it is going to be out in April of 2021. So, uh, stay tuned for info on that and, um, have a great one and I'll talk to you next week.